Romans chapter 15, and our lesson will be taken from 17 and following. <clears throat> Paul is in the process of explaining why he wrote the letter to the Romans. Sort of like suddenly you get a letter out of nowhere from a preacher who begins to de develop to you important truths. And you say, why is he writing to us? We don't really have anything to do with him. We know who he is, but we've really never met him. And he's never been here. So why is he giving us all this information? And that's sort of the way it is with the Apostle Paul. So in verses 17 to 21, he gives us a sentence of why, as he continues to tell us why he wrote to the Romans and to clarify his ministry with them. It is also an encouragement to us when we read it as well. And since Paul was commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles, it was right and it is proper for him to write to the Rome church because no apostolic person had ever been there. None of the apostles had arrived there or visited with them. So Paul wrote on the onset that his goal was to strengthen the faith of the church <clears throat> at Rome. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 where Paul on the onset in his introduction says this, Romans chapter one, verse 11, for I long to see you so that I might impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is that I may encourage, be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. So his object was that he might strengthen this church and also give some validation and to the church of their faith in him. And so he says, so he's writing this and he says, here's the reason I wrote the letter. And in this particular section, verses 17 to 21, he's gonna clarify his ministry and give us a method of his ministry. How did he go about taking uh, care of the ap apostolic job that he was appointed to. And he says in verse, in, in this verse, that uh, in, in, in our verse we have before us, he said, I am here to encourage you. I am emboldened to encourage you. And he says, literally, I therefore boast in Christ Jesus the things toward God. Paul said, I can come. I can come because I'm an apostle and I really can boast of it in the person of Christ. He's not making a personal boast here. He's really making a boast here about what Christ has done for him. And he says, all I've ever desired to do is to glorify Christ, to glorify his, my master, and to give discharge to the commission that I've been given. In fact, in Colossians 3.17, this is something we all are to do. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You're to give thanks. Everything we do is for him. Whether we harvest or whether we're in an office, whether we're a salesman or a housewife, or whether we're a secretary or a nurse, whatever your job is, you and I are to glorify Jesus Christ. That is to be the sub and substance of our life and our family. We are to glorify him and not to do those things which calls attention to ourselves. It's interesting when you compare the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Paul. Moses' whole life and ministry was outwardly magnificent. He has led the children of Israel out of Egypt by awe-inspiring miracles. And which of us have ever read them have said, man, that is unbelievable what God did there. The exodus from Egypt humbled the greatest nations of its day and placed fear in all the surrounding nations. And God defended Moses by swallowing up his enemies. 
ground opened up, and they were swallowed. When you look at the Apostle Paul's ministry, however, which was to offer up the Gentiles as a priest would offer a sacrifice to God, it's altogether different. He gloried in the fact that he was rejected by the world. And he's sharing in the sufferings of Christ. That was his glory, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. He felt it a privilege to suffer for Christ. And on the other hand, it required spiritual discernment to really notice and see Paul's place in ministry. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.11, where he makes this known. So his ministry to many people was hidden. They didn't really understand his ministry at all. I don't think anybody living in Israel and even those around Israel had any, had any notion that anybody else but Moses was leading them. But in the case of the Apostle Paul, we read this. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men but we are made manifest to God. And listen to this next line. And I hope that we are made manifest also to you in your conscience. So he is made manifest to God, but there were people at Corinth that didn't recognize his authority and even questioned whether he should be an apostle or not. So he writes this letter and he says, he shows his humility in verse 18, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. So Paul says, I'm not presuming, I dare not speak, I will not speak of anything but what Christ has done for me. Paul is saying this because he's considered himself as the least of apostles. Follow with me in the verses. Ephesians 3.8, he says this, to me, the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach the gospel, the unfathomable riches of Christ. I'm the least of all saints. If he were there, here this morning, he would say, the, the most immature Christian here, I'm even least than that. That's how he recognized himself. He didn't need a parade. He didn't need a Rolex watch. He didn't need to be on television. He didn't need to ride in a limousine. He didn't need all that. And yet he was the greatest preacher of our day, was he not? 1 Corinthians 15.8, 15, 15.9, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15.9. He says, for I am the least of all the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he considers himself the least of all the saints. Then he considers himself the least of all the apostles. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he makes this statement. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Paul was very much aware of his situation. He had persecuted the church. That humbled him. He realized that even though God had given him uh, a special commission to go to the Gentiles, he would be the missionary to the Gentiles. He would be the apostles to the Gentiles. He had a great ministry, yet he never bragged about it other than what God had done for him. Reminds us we got to be careful about that too. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. You know, we're excited about what God has done at Countryside Bible Church, but let's never forget it's God's work, not ours. It's God who did this, not us. And we're just thankful that, they, that he uses us. In Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, I remember this verse. Uh, <clears throat> Kansas University is known for its basketball, and they had an All-American who played, Wayne Simeon. And on senior night, the last night at the game, they're supposed to give uh, just a, a recording of it. 
and they're supposed to just say some nice things about playing for KU and nice things about the coach and the crowd. And here he got up, and here's what he said. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a man boast of his riches, but let him boast, boast in this, of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercise loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. And before 16,000 people, he shared the gospel. So after that, most of any players now monitored. He took a stand for Christ, and he boasts only in the Lord. What's your boast? You're a good farmer, good businessman, good mother, good this, that, or the other thing. Our boast should be what? In the Lord and the Lord alone. Whatever is accomplished for us is accomplished by him. As Paul said in Romans chapter 1 through 5, he says, I, through faith we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. And that's his next line in this verse. His ministry and what Christ accomplished was the result of in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. True salvation is in word and deed. Our talk is, should be backed up by our walk. When people, when God analyzes us and when he looks at us, our walk should be before our talk. The obedience of the Gentiles is a line that runs clear through the book of Romans. In other words, if you're really born again, then your life should show it. If you've really been set apart by Christ and you're in Christ, then that progressive growth, that progressive sanctification, one should become more mature and more mature day by day by day in him. Notice what Jesus said in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my what? Commandments. Love is shown by our obedience. Love isn't shown just because we can get, stand up and give a testimony. Love is shown by our obedience and following him. Very important. In Romans 6, 16, follow there. <clears throat> he tells us again. He talks about the fact that we ought to consider ourselves dead to sin. And then he makes this, this, point, this statement. Do you not know when you present yourself to someone as a slave for obedience, you are a slave of that one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? We're a slave to whoever we give ourselves. And if we give ourselves to the Lord, then obedience results, part of it. Romans 6, 19, for the report of your obedience has reached to all. This is a Roman church of which had an impact in the entire Christian world at that time. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Their obedience had spread far and wide. <clears throat> so we could ask the question when people think of countryside, what do they think of this church? Our obedience to God, our love to God, our devotion to him has lived out in our relationship in the community, business-wise, neighborly, and all of that. You know, it's interesting, when a church got started, Paul got a church started, and the emphasis was on strong evangelism. When the church got into the community, then the church itself, the collective assembly of the saints, took on that role. And people would look at the church and see the people going in and out and communicating and fellowship with one another was such that it drew them to Christ. Their life was so different, and their life had an impact. 
And I'm afraid today in our world, we are trying to live so close to the world that people see no difference. I don't mean we need to be odd ducks, wear odd clothes and all that, but our life, our language ought to be such that it's different than the people around us. <clears throat> Look at Romans 16, 26. Look at verse 19 first, Romans 16, 19. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over y you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. I think I just read that. I called it six. How about 1626? But now is manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. You hear the gospel, we respond to the gospel, and having been transformed, we live out the gospel. And Paul said that is the evidence of his ministry. The people had been transformed and transformed lives as a result of hearing the ministry. That was his goal. We see the apostles' testimony in verse 19. In Romans 15, 19, in the power and signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and around about as far as Ilricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ in powers and signs and wonders and the powers of the Spirit. Now today we have a power and sign movement among evangelical Christians and even some of its pure heresy outside what I would consider even uh, Christianity itself. And the emphasis is on uh, powers and signs and miracles and tongue speaking and all of this. The words, and, the words and deeds are evidence of the ministry. And so it was powered by the Holy Spirit. But also to the apostles was given certain powers of miracles and signs. And Paul answered the critics of his apostolic authority in Corinth, in Corinth by saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. So when Paul went and preached, he was able to perform miracles and signs which gave validation to the fact, authentication, that he was from Christ, that he was authentic, that he was the real deal. And do the other apostles. Turn with me to Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, even though this is a questionable passage to some. There's a very interesting line in this. It is true, I think. I know it is. And the, so then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they, the disciples, went out and preached everywhere while the wor Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by signs that followed. In the book of Acts, every miracle that happened in Jesus' ministry, with the exception of feeding the 5,000 and 4,000, is repeated in the book of Acts. People were raised from the dead. Remember the guy who was listening to Paul preach, Eutychus? And he was sitting in the window, and Paul preached past midnight, and he went to sleep and fell out of the window and died. And Paul raised him from the dead. If you go to sleep in this church, I can't do much about it. If you're going to die here, your, your destiny better be determined by now. I, I, if you sleep, that's okay. If you trust me to keep going, and you don't need to listen, snooze. Some of you do it pretty good. You don't even bow your head, you just keep looking. It's like a guy in class, he was sleeping. So a guy pokes him, you're supposed to pray. So he stands up in the middle of class and prays. <laughs> it's 
So if you see somebody uh, sleep and poke them and say, he wants you to stand up and pray. <laughs> Be a way to cure it, wouldn't it? I know you worked hard and it's hard to do and I'm boring, so, it's, so I understand, that's no problem. Look at another passage to see that this really, this really uh, is valid. You see, at Countryside Bible Church, we take the position that signs, miracles, wonders, and tongues have ceased. And they have ceased at the fulfillment of all of Scripture. So signs, wonders, and tongue speaking and prophetic messages are out. We have people today running around claiming to be prophets. God spoke to them. Whenever you hear, God spoke to me, put a red flag up. God only speaks to people through this book. He's already spoken. And if God is still speaking to people today, then we have to run around all over the world, find out the latest word from God. This is the latest word from God. And so we need to be careful when we hear people or preachers claim to be prophets or people claiming to hear the word of God. We need to be careful about that. That's heresy. God only speaks through this word. And so people get insights and this and that, and they say, God spoke to me, and I've got this insight, and so forth and so on. Well, you, all, your, all our insights come from this book. Here's where it comes from. And we don't need signs and miracles to validate God's word. We walk by faith, not by sight. Once the word was written down, it was written down forever for us, and there won't be signs until after Christ comes for the church called the rapture. And during that time, we'll have a couple prophets who will be raised, who will do all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders. They will be killed and they will be taken into heaven. <clears throat> but not till then. Uh, prophecy, uh, I've heard it said, is two kinds of prophecies. One is uh, preaching as a prophecy, preaching the prophets. No. All a preacher is, should be, a godly preacher, a biblical preacher, is preaching what the Word of God says, word for word, explaining it to you in the best of his ability, and letting the Holy Spirit use his word. I'm not here to give you something new. I'm just here to remind you what's been said. I don't have anything new to give you other than what's in this book. It may be new to you. You never heard it before. But it's, I pray my teaching is from the book. So be aware of that stuff. Look what he said in Hebrews chapter 1, or 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. The writer of the Hebrews, whoever that may be, the writer of the Hebrews, if, if God wanted us to know who the writer of the Hebrews was, he'd have told us. But the writer of the Hebrews says, For if the word spoken through the angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedient receive just penalty, a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. He applies it really to those apostles and prophets. And Ephesians 2.20 says, the church was built upon prophets and apostles. Apostles. Everybody from Peter to Paul. From prophets, we have Mark, Luke, James, the half-brother of Christ, Jude, the half-brother of Christ. There we are, prophets. And at the day that, the apostolic day, the book of Acts, there were prophets. And there were even some women that were prophets. And a prophet literally speaks from God the word of God. So somebody claiming today, I'm a prophet, or says, God told me, question mark. Question mark. Prophecy means the same thing in the New Testament it did in the Old Testament. It's passe at this point in time. 
It'll return. And they were doing extraordinary miracles. Look at Acts 19, verses 11 to 13. Turn with me there. I mean, I hate to make fun of this, but I, I, uh, I have watched uh, Benny Hinn heal himself. Benny Hinn was preaching on television, uh, if you want to be healed, touch the screen. So Benny Hinn was at home and he had a bad cold. And he wanted to get over it, so he went to the screen and touched himself on the screen. Now I'm sorry. That's ridiculous. There are times God doesn't want you to be healed. There are times you've prayed for people to be healed and they weren't healed, right? Can you testify to that? You prayed for people and they weren't healed. It wasn't God's will. It's not God's will that everybody be healed. It is God's will sometimes that we go through these trials and we go through these illnesses. Why? That we might share the sufferings of Christ and realize how close we can get to Him. Everybody's going to die unless the Lord comes before it, and that's a possibility. But you know what? We're going to die of something. You're going to die, die. You don't die in an accident or an act of God, as we call it. You're going to die of a disease because we live in a cursed body. We're going to die of something. It's going to be cancer. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's going to be something else. God doesn't always heal us. Sometimes by his grace, he does miraculously. You've all heard of Kelly uh, Swantek, how she thought they had a cancer problem and they found out it was nothing. God does that. And sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes we have to go through it. You know what these times are for? While you're not ill, now you're not sick, while you're facing and some of these things, Get yourself into the Word of God. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior so when the rain comes into our life, we can withstand that. These are times for preparation. In light of what you see, as we're talking about a little bit this morning in our prayer meeting, in light of what you're seeing in this nation right now, you as Christians and we as a church better remember, we better start facing the fact that we're going to face persecution someday. Whenever this little respite twists around and the enemies that we have and we've seen the last couple of weeks, they don't care about justice. They just care about controlling you. And this social movement is nothing more than communism. And it's going to turn around and it's going to bite us worse than it ever did before. And so, if you ever needed to get into the Word of God, you need to do it now. And you need to take your stand. Well, sorry for that rabbit trail. Look at Acts. Is that, is that where I left off? Acts 19, 11 to 13. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. Then you go to 2 Timothy, his last letter to Timothy telling him to come quickly. And here's what he says to Timothy as he closes his letter. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick in Miletus. Why didn't he send a hanky to Paul? Why didn't Paul send him a hanky? Because as the scriptures evidently were being fulfilled, what the ministry of miracles and signs were ebbing and go leaving. 
Furthermore, in 1 Timothy 5, he told Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. In other words, take some medicine. Why couldn't he have sent him a handkerchief and had him healed? So signs and miracles did accompany Paul, just as he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Now remember, there are also false signs. Remember Moses threw his rod down and what happened? Or Aaron threw his rod down and became a snake. So did the false priests. They could throw their sign down and a snake appeared, right? But what happened to their snakes? Aaron swallowed them all, showing that his was real. Now he says, so that from Jerusalem and round as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul continues to affirm his resume as he relates that he has fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum. This is a distance of 1,400 miles. <clears throat> One man. Illyricum is known as Yugoslavia, Albania, Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, and Dalmatia. That would be that country. It would be to the east of Italy, the, boot, the, uh, the peninsula, be next to Macedonia, northern Greece. We don't have any record that Paul went there in the book of Acts, but evidently he could have gone there when he was preaching in Macedonia, northern Greece. He evidently was there. He fully preached the gospel. That can be taken two ways. He fully preached the gospel in that he covered the entire land with the gospel. Or it can mean that wherever he went, he fully delivered the message of the gospel. He preached and taught the full gospel message. And one example is given in Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Turn there in your Bible and see that particular incident. <clears throat> In this particular passage, he re we read this. Now when they had traveled from Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, and there was a synagogue of the Jews. According to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Most scholars think he hadn't been there more than six weeks. Now read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. We're not going to do that this morning, but read it on your own. Do you know what the hot button was in those two epistles? The hot button was about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Paul, in that short a time, a little over a month, preached in Thessalonica, a church that had never heard the Word of God before, a place where there was no one saved but, but a few women. And here we have a church beginning, and they know the rapture of the church, the tribulation of the church, the Antichrist, and they know a lot of other doctrines, which many churches today have never even discussed the second coming of Christ. You want to talk about a thorough ministry. Or when Paul says as he meets the elders at Miletus, the Ephesian elders, he said, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. That's why it's important to go through the word verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept, so you get the whole word of God, not bit here and a bit there. As I've told many of you before, I had a friend who was a uh, who got saved reading the Bible. He was a cardiologist. He argued that Christianity it was an immoral religion. 
And his son came home, the married son, and he said, guess what? My boss thinks I should read the Bible. Probably if you'd say that now, he'd get fired. But anyway, he, sa he said, can you imagine anything so ridiculous, Dad? His dad said, I think every man should read the Bible. An intellectual man should read the Bible. Went out, bought a Bible, bought a tape, put earphones in his ear, and read the Bible for an hour a night. He said, that's why he's going to read the Bible. I said, Murray, when did you get saved? In the middle of the Old Testament. I said, nobody gets saved in the middle of the Old Testament. What, what was that that impressed you? He said, the unity of the Scriptures. Most of us don't even know there's a unity of Scriptures because we've never read it. We get a little bit here and a little bit there, and we are in churches where there's a little bit preached here and a verse preached here and a philosophy preached here. There's no continuity to what's going on. Man, this message goes nowhere where I thought it would. Read the Bible. Paul preached it. And in six weeks, they knew more doctrine than the average church today by far. What a teacher. I preached the gospel. So, he, uh, so the church at Thessalonica is well taught. And then he says in verse 20, Thus I inspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, that I might not build on another man's foundation. The word aspired means a manner of operation. Aspired really means to strive. Could be read, I bind myself. I'm serious about this. I bind myself to preach the gospel. We talked about this this morning earlier. The preaching of the gospel is the external message of the gospel. Christ died for us. He was buried. He rose again. You must believe in him. You must put your faith and trust in him. That is the external gospel. It is complemented by the Holy Spirit who takes it and makes it clear and plain, gives us the faith to believe. And as a result, our lives are changed. And it's evident in word and deed. But we have to preach and tell the gospel. I was at a funeral some time ago, and the guy got up and preached, and he preached how, how wonderful heaven was, how wonderful lives are that follow God. But nobody in the whole service ever said, here's how you get there. Nobody explained the gospel. And as I told people on Wednesday night, I got a letter from a friend who said, why does it say in Lamentations chapter 7 that in the house of mourning you learn more? Is a wide example of that. And it's because in the house of the mourners, the funeral house, is where people think about life. You don't think about it at a, a, a party. You don't think about it at an outing. You don't think about it at a ball game. You think about it when you're sitting in a funeral home and seeing the people cry, and when, then you think, what about my life? What are they going to say about me? And you begin to think seriously, and if ever the truth needs to be taught, it needs to be taught at a funeral. And it ought to be taught everywhere, as far as that goes. He said, I made that my, I bind myself to that. Paul entered cities where no one ever entered, whoever had heard of the gospel. Can you imagine that? Uh, that's hard for me to believe. For me to walk in a town where they never even heard of Jesus Christ and preach Jesus Christ and establish a church, let alone. In six weeks? Wow. 
He had a, he had a true spirit of pioneer evangelism, didn't he? Some of us have been in cities and we've never shared the gospel with anybody. He entered cities where no known believers existed. He reached the unreach. He was truly a New Testament evangelist. Then he said that I might not build on another man's foundation. He went where no one else went. <clears throat> it's not wrong to build on another man, preacher's foundation since that is a part of the plan of God, isn't it? His purpose was to lay a foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11, he says, For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus. But I, I go there and I lay the foundation. After which, he'd have to missionary journey, he appointed elders to carry on that ministry. Appointed elders in every city. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verses 5 to 9. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 9. <clears throat> the Corinthians were in a uh, campaign. They had factions in the church, and one was saying, I'm of Peter. Peter is my favorite preacher. I'm of Apollos. And some said, well. I'm of Christ. And then, of course, some of Paul. So Paul writes back to this church, and here's what he says. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even the law, as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Paul was in Corinth. He planted. Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. As a result, then, you could say, verse 7, So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. We're right back again. If you're going to boast, boast in God, right? Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own award according to his labor. For we are now, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. It takes all of us. It takes all of us to make it go here. That's, his, that's the ministry of Apostle Paul. Somebody else planted this. We're adding to it. I'm just building on somebody else's foundation. I remember when this church whole thing got started. I remember the men, one of them was my own father. And I'm building on his foundation. And so are you. So all of us are together in this. Isn't that great? I was, I was telling the class. When someone is blessed in this church and someone comes to know Christ in this church, when, someone, when somebody really is blessed by what God is doing here, all of us are a part of that. It's not me. It's all of us. I pray for you. You pray for me. We all give to this that God would do it. We all share in what's going on. It's not one more than another. You know, if you weren't here, I wouldn't have a job. I need you, you need me. And all of us together make this thing go. And when somebody comes to know Christ, it isn't because it's the preacher you have. It's the church you have. It's the church we have. It may be nothing more than you saying to someone coming through the door, hey, how are you doing? We're praying for you. It may be that you sat in the foyer or talked in the foyer and somebody said something and it clicked in your mind and you said, yeah, I'm short in there. Or it may have been the preacher. 
or you may have been encouraged by someone. We're all involved in that. And that's why the devil loves to come in and make factions. Because he knows the most powerful tool in this age is a church that stands united for Jesus Christ, loving one another. So the devil likes to get on the edge and nitpick, and I don't know of any problem that's going on. I'm just saying this is what happens. And they nitpick, and we get these factions. And I like this teacher better than another, and I like them better than another. We're all involved here. We're all involved. And that's what builds a church. And Paul said, I go where no one else has gone. I don't build on anybody else's foundation. And then he explains it in 1 Corinthians. All of us are involved. Some plant, some water, some teach, some encourage. All of us have different gifts. We all use them in a different way. And every gift is different because every personality is different. I like that about God, don't you? I like about the fact that there's variety. Each in their own way. We don't have to rubber stamp everything. Everything has to be done this way or it isn't done right. Then last verse, 21. But as it's written, so he goes to the apostolic encouragement. As it's written, they who have no news of him shall see him. And they who have not heard shall understand. This is a quote from Isaiah from the first part of that verse which says, for what, <clears throat> for what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. And this is a forecast of the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom. And Paul uses this and he says, what had not been told them they'll see and understand. And Paul plus, applies this process to his evangelism in our age. We are told to tell the world of Christ, the Savior, and the coming King. It is God's will to make Christ known now. So here's what he said just before Christ ascended in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe some things. Is that what he said? What? All things. That's job security. We got to teach all things. Even the kings of the Old Testament. The book of Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Malachi, Hosea, Leviticus. We need to know it all, don't we? Teaching all things. You haven't been arrived unless we know it all. And I can tell you for sure I haven't arrived. Still more to do and still more to learn. I've been, I've been in this. I don't want to brag about it, and I don't mean to. I've been in this for over 50 years. I'm closer to 60 than I am 50 in the ministry. I still cannot believe what I'm learning. I cannot believe when I study a message and say, man, I never saw this before. I've read it. I've even preached the Romans before. And I wonder when I'm preaching through Romans this time, what in the world did I say the last time? Destroy the tapes. <laughs> Don't let anybody read them. Go, therefore, and make disciples. You notice what it doesn't say? It doesn't say, tell people to come to our church. What does it say? Go. Go. It's the sheep that have the sheep, not the shepherd. Right? I'm an under-shepherd. I need to carry out the witness to and be an evangelist in my ministry as well. But the congregation is a sheep, and it's the sheep who have the sheep, not the shepherd. 
And so you need to bone ourselves up in the Word of God and do what Paul did, bind ourselves that we're here to share the gospel. There's a lot of people in our community who are lost. You believe that? Well, I do. And I pray for these cities around us, that God will open the door. And I pray, too, that it is not just local evangelism, but it's also spreading the Word of God abroad. I have, we have two children. One's in Brazil right now, preaching the gospel and teaching men. And I have another son-in-law who will be leaving today, and that's what he tends to be a part of, as somebody else teaches. In Africa, I think it's Maui. We have a responsibility not only here, but across the ocean. Our job is not done until the gospel is preached everywhere. Can you imagine one guy saying, I fully preached the gospel from Dallas to Canada, from Jerusalem to Illyricum, I preached the gospel. Here we are with all the modern mechanizations that you can imagine. And as far as Christians coming to Christ, I wonder if we aren't even losing ground. Because the church has been drifted away from the solid teaching of the Word of God and away from what's really truth. May God help us at Countryside Bible Church to preach the truth, to love the Word, to honor our Lord Jesus Christ, and see through the Word of God an impact in our communities. Let us stand for prayer. <clears throat> Father and God, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done here. We thank you, Lord, that uh, your word has been blessed and your word goes forth. We praise you, Lord, that the Spirit of God still uses his word. We thank you, Lord, for bringing Nick back and giving him a measure of health and strength. Pray that you continue to work in him, and we thank you for his family. Thank you for others in our ministry, Lord, who are facing surgery, who are facing issues financially, marriage-wise, or whatever. May they find in your word the help and comfort that you will give, for your word is sufficient for all. Pray for those who are suffering and depressed. May they go to your word and put their eyes on you and look to you for strength and trust you for the day and tomorrow. And Father, we just pray that the word of God will penetrate our hearts and lives. Thank you for the nation we live in, but we are expecting troublesome times ahead. Help us, Father, to gain control of our lives and be brave. Be courageous, spread the word of God even when it isn't popular. As you told Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season, when it's popular and when it's not. So Heavenly Father, we dismiss this morning, ask your blessing on your word as it grows in our heart and life. Protect us and keep us through this week. Should you tarry, we pray in Christ's name, amen.